coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee break with me. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee. Come and take your coffee break with me. Hello and welcome to Coffee Break with Candace. We're so glad you're here with us today. I have a very special surprise and I'm gonna let him introduce himself and tell us more. Hi, my name is David Marino and I have worked with Candace before. I actually did a profile piece on her, a video for Black History Month. And um, so I consider myself a storyteller as well. I know Candace does all of these interviews which are always very interesting and sharing the positivity in the world that people are doing and so i'm actually going to be guest hosting with candace so i'll be doing a few episodes a month which i'm very excited about and very thankful that uh you reached out to me to do that so that's very exciting i have a background in communication yes yeah so i for 16 years i was in the news industry so i was a reporter for most of that time the last five years of that business i was a news manager I transitioned out of that and went into city government and I worked for the city of Buda and that's how we met because when I while I was working for the city of Buda as communications director one of my responsibilities was shooting videos for the city and telling the story of the city and just uh, anything revolving around different issues impacting Buda or even for specific months like Black History Month which is how we met because I did a story for Buda on Black History Month and profiled you as our subject. And so that was very exciting. I work now for a water conservation district in Austin, but still doing the same things along the lines of communication and telling stories and doing videos and, and all of that types of, of, of stuff. So that's how this kind of all kind of came to fruition with us and, and moving forward with this. So I thought that was very exciting that you reached out to me like, few weeks after I left Buda and asked if I would be, you know, interested in, in doing some of these episodes. Well, I'm excited to have you. What has spurred your love of story? I can remember being like a child and writing stories. Like I used to write, I would always make up things in my head and, and you know, my mom still has like a folder of these little I wrote I wrote scary stories I've always loved <laughs> scary movies since I was a child I used to watch them even though my mom didn't like that but my dad and I would watch them and uh, I just liked writing I always liked writing I always liked kind of disappearing into mm. another world and I think that that helped as you know when I was younger I, I journaled even for for a while and I think that it was always just an escape for me and I, I ended up you know later in life it's funny how things come back full circle you know my first year in college I was a music major oh, <laughs> I played awesome. I played viola and um, I thought that was gonna be the direction I went but I ended up changing and my major and ultimately went into communications radio television broadcasting and my love again for storytelling like came full circle and I think for me, that was what was so um, exciting about that industry or that field was that I was able to share people's experiences. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like the person that's there to sort of facilitate that and then put it out to the world. And that idea of being able to interview somebody, take what they've said and put it together in a way that is consumable to the public and then create and edit I like the process of putting things together. So for me, that was very appealing. And so that's what led in my path down into to news. You know, when I was in college, I started interning in San Antonio. I'm from San Antonio. I went to school at Angelo State University in San Angelo. But in the summer, I ended up, the first summer, it was just volunteering. I ended up volunteering at a radio station and it was multiple stations in the same building. There was like the rock station and the country station and the pop station. And then there was the AM news talk station. I thought I was gonna be like a DJ or something and end up like oh, in the cool. FM. Mm -hmm. But I ended up in the newsroom. I met my mentor at the time, Tracy Evans, who I've got to give a shout out to. I met her at that time. 
and she was a news reporter there in San Antonio for, for that station. And I just got sucked into it. it. It was really exciting, the idea of from day to day, you don't know what's happening. It was, there's so many different things happening every day and you don't know what you're gonna be covering. And so they would let me take, we had tape recorders back then, it was in the 90s, <laughs> still tape recorders, which the young people don't know what that is. Or maybe they do because things are all coming back now. True, very um, true. I would go out and get tape of like man on the street, sort of like whatever story of the day they wanted to get comments on, whatever was topical. I'd go out at like gas stations and try to catch people while they're getting gas. What do you think about this or that? Then I'd come back and they'd put the tape together. So that's how I started in news. And she, Tracy, really took me under her wing and and sort of nurtured, you know, the talents that I had and helped refine that. And, you know, I was really uh, green <laughs> when I started and it it took a while. And while I was there, you know, the next summer, I actually interned for, for real and I got to do newscasts on the air, like anchoring weekend newscasts and oh, wow. going out and doing, um, you know, getting tape again for radio. And so after college, I ended up working in news radio for three years, first station in San Antonio. And then I transitioned into television news and I worked in Midland, Tucson, went back to Midland, did like a short stint in San Antonio freelancing, then ultimately ended up in Austin where I was a news manager. So that sort of sums up my news career, you know, up to that point. But back to your to your question about storytelling, I just, you know, again, I feel like it's a way to escape into somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. um, and I get joy out of sharing other people's experiences and also learning. Same for me. I think when you when you talk to people and you, and you learn about their life or you learn about their experiences, it very much can be eye-opening for yourself things that you didn't think of you know and I think and you probably experienced this sometimes you go into an interview thinking that you you have an idea of what the story is going to be in your mind and then you start talking to your the person and they just bring up things that you weren't expecting to hear and you end up going in a totally different direction and learning more than you thought you would ever learn and then your perspective just changes and for me the the learning part and learning what other people's experiences are is so important and I think as human beings you know we're all in our own bubbles most of the time yeah very true and unless you are exposed to other people and learn about their life or learn about what they've gone through or, or what they had to do to get to where they are you don't always appreciate, you know, things. And I, and I think it's really important as a, as a person to learn about other people, to understand their, you know, the positives and their struggles, because, you know, I think that's even where we are in the world today. There's a lot of divisiveness because people don't listen. They don't sit down and just try to understand somebody else's perspective. And for store, with storytelling, I think that's all, that a lot of it, that's what it is. It's, it's taking somebody's perspective and, and putting that into a story form and sharing it with the world. And I've always enjoyed that. And, and I like, again, the focus being on, on that person and me just being sort of the, you know, the, the one that facilitates it. Not necessarily the focus on me, but just taking that. There's something... Ex to me that just feels like that fulfills my creative sort of need and it it just makes me happy I guess is what at the end of the day happy knowing that that person's story is out in the world and people are reacting in a positive way to it I really I would say in my life in the last five or six years have become more focused on on what I surround myself with and what I want out of my own life in terms of, of positivity. Um, I think we can all go to dark places. We all experience our own struggles and I've experienced mine. And, and I think that I've reached a point in my life, especially getting older, that, you know, there are just some things that are not worth it. And, true, so true. And, yeah. <laughs> and I'm still very much in that self-discovery mode and a work in progress. But 
I will say, you know, this all kind of, it, it comes into this when it, you talk about storytelling. When I worked for the city of Buda, I think what was so eye-opening for me and what, what became sort of, what showed me what my talents were, where my strong points were, was because I got that job. When I was in news, I had to tell a lot of stories that were, you know, like the shootings and the fires and the just the, the things that are not always very uplifting. Mm -hmm. When I got to Buda, I was the first public information officer hired for the city. So I was able to, to kind of come in and shape that position. There was no blueprint of how that was going to work. And that's a little stressful when you come into a new Absolutely. job and you don't have any sort of something to measure yourself with. But on the flip side of that, it's exciting because you can do different things and, t and kind of take some chances and, and see what works and what doesn't. And they were very receptive to that, which I was appreciative of. And so that's how I got back into, I, you know, my job was doing press releases and doing the website and putting out social media posts. But what I wasn't doing anymore was the video stuff, which mm -hmm. I loved in news. And so I thought I wasn't always a shooter but I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer, I can voice, I can edit. And I thought, I'm just gonna get a camera and just start shooting. I'm still not the best shooter in the world. But what I started doing was these different profile pieces on history of Buda or paying it forward, you know, positive clips of, of the things that people were doing in the community that were having, a, you know, an awesome impact on other people. And in doing those stories and in getting back to sort of the storytelling and doing the video, I really felt like a, it It kind of got me on a path of, okay, this is more what I want to do. Hi, I am Chef Vita, owner of Jules Cajun and Southern Cuisine. And this morning we are going to, well, I'm gonna show you how to make an omelet real simple. First of all, I wanna show you this omelet maker right here that I purchased off of Amazon. It's only maybe like 20 bucks, okay? And of course, red is one of my favorite colors, so I got red. This omelet, iron is already hot and i've already sprayed it with a little canola oil um it's available where you can make like two omelets at the same time cool huh okay so what i would do is i am going to pour some egg white uh i usually use egg white you can use like the liquid eggs if you want or you can scramble your eggs if you would like to i'm going to pour a little bit of egg white in both sides and you have to be kind of quick because it starts cooking real fast now as far as what you want in your omelet is whatever you would like so right here i have sauteed some onions and bell peppers i'm gonna put that in both of the omelets and the good thing about this say for instance you can make one omelet one way and another one on the other side you're making omelets for two people and want two different things so I'm putting the sautés, onions, and bell peppers in there. Your meat of your choice. I would suggest once again, you can get like the crumbled sausage or uh, the bacon, crumble it up. I would suggest, you know, doing it ahead of time. I put mine in the refrigerator in these little plastic containers because I make omelets all the time. They're quick breakfast. Does not take long at all. I love mushrooms. So I'm gonna throw some mushrooms in there. And what's the omelet without cheese? Okay. So then you wanna pour your cheese, any cheese that you would like. If you want one or two different types of cheeses, that's fine. But you wanna pour, put your cheese in there. Now, someone asked me before, what about salt and pepper? Well, I'm gonna tell you, cheese has a lot of salt in it. So um, I usually don't do this, but sometimes if you want, sometimes I may put a little Tony Sachery in there. But right now, that's a lot of cheese in there. Then you want to seal it with some more egg white until it's filled up all the way to the brim. Now it's already started cooking. 
And then I am going to close it for a couple of minutes. And I'm going to chat with you for a bit. And then we're going to come back and have our omelet. I have never, ever been able to cook an omelet in the regular stove, uh, in a regular pan where you flip it. It always, like, broke up. And one day uh, when I was catering and I started doing a lot of brunches and then I found this omelet machine on Amazon. So I've told a lot of my friends, you know, to go and check out this omelet maker on Amazon. Like I said, it only costs maybe $20, $25. I don't even think it's that much. But uh, this is very convenient, especially in the mornings, uh, instead of grabbing that donut, um, you know, very cost effective, you know, just get your little ingredients together ahead of time and make your own omelet. Now, you know, when I go to the restaurants and order an omelet, I can never eat the whole omelet. I think they use like three eggs or something. That's too many eggs for me. So um, using this omelet maker is just perfect, perfect. So, so I'm gonna let you peep at it real quick. See how it's puffing up, puffing up. A couple more minutes and it will be done. Um, once again, like I said before, I am uh, the owner of Jules Cajun and Southern Cuisine. And from time to time, I may be showing you some recipes out of my kitchen here at home, or I may be online, um, online mm. on the food truck <laughs> and uh, showing you some things. Most of the time I am on the food truck. So maybe the next episode um, will show you some dishes that I actually do on the food truck. Ooh, it's puffing up really, really good. I'm located in the San Antonio area. My website is JulesGumboAndMore.com. That's J-E-W-E-L-L-S Gumbo, G-U-M-B-O-A-N-D-M-O-R-E.com. And our omelet is smelling good. And you can serve it up by itself, or you can eat it with some toast, or you can... Get that grits. Hey, the instant grits is just as good. Five minutes, you know, three minutes in the microwave. And you will have your full-blown omelet. Let's see what we have here. Now, I do want to tell you, if you put a whole lot of cheese in it, it's going to take a little bit longer to, like, firm up and everything. So, let's see what we have here. Mm-hmm. Mm it is almost done. I love egg whites. I just love egg whites. Anytime I do these for like brunches or catering and everything, I usually just use the egg whites. And like I said, you can put just about anything you would like. A lot of cheese. Let me do it this way. So we get it all up under it. There we go. There we go. Ooh. Okay. And here is my omelet. And that is it for today. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? I'm Dr. Hoke Effion, board certified pediatrician and ADHD consultant. And it's my utmost pleasure to present to you the segment called Brain Power. Why the brain? Yes, that's a great question and I'm glad you asked. So, the brain is the one organ that controls every bit of every function that goes on in your body, which means that if you take care of your brain and you fall in love with the physical help of your brain. You know, we often hear about, oh, take care of your body and take care of your mind and eat good food. And some of us are tired of hearing those stories and those statements, but you know what? We so seldom hear about loving your brain. And you know that's the missing piece because when you fall deeply in love with your brain yes you heard that right this is for kids and parents when you fall deeply in love with your brain your brain loves you back and guess how it shows up it shows up in improved health it shows up in your mind working better it shows up in feeling stronger it shows up as 
having better relationships, having better relationships with your money, with people, with with your animals. It shows up as being more creative. It shows up as feeling stronger and sleeping better. I mean, your entire life can be changed if you fall in love with the physical health of your brain, which means that you have to remember that food can either be medicine or poison for your brain. So that's why it's not just, oh yeah, eat healthy, it's gonna make you feel better. No, actually, food is medicine for your brain. So if you put not good food in your body, guess what you're doing to your brain? You're feeding your brain things that are not good for it. And guess what happens? Your mind won't function well. You'll feel lousy. You'll feel sick. You'll feel like, ah, I just don't want to function today. And, but if you change that thought around and you start seeing whatever you do, your actions in light of hey, you know what, is this good for my brain or is this not good for my brain? Then you're more likely to take actions that will improve the overall health of your life. Because to fall in love with your brain is to fall in love with your life. So who's on the challenge with me? I hope you come along with me and join in on this segment. And I'm so looking forward to going through the series of brain power. Brain power for your life, brain power for your, your mind, brain power for your body, brain power for your environment. Basically, how everything in our life affects our brains and how we can improve and grow stronger. And guess what happens, kids and parents, when you do this together, Guess what? It increases and strengthens the bond that your family has. And what's better than that? I mean, as a pediatrician, that's my biggest joy is for parents and children to work together, to love each other, to grow together and to be stronger together. Because guess what? When there's a strong family unit, we are stronger as a community. We are stronger as a country. We are stronger as a world, right? So. I'm so excited and I hope to see you every month. So stay tuned and have an amazing, amazing rest of your week. And remember, love your brain, love your life. Hi, I am here to talk about one of my favorite artists and that is Randy Newman. Uh, Randy Newman was born uh, in Los Angeles but spent a lot of his childhood in Louisiana and specifically New Orleans. Uh, I think his mother's family was from New Orleans. Uh, anyway, I feel like that um, kind of New Orleans style jazz and roots and, and blues music comes through in his playing so well. Um, I think there's also like a cleverness to a lot of the chord uh, progressions that he uses that I think, um, you know, can draw from from that New Orleans tradition. Uh, and certainly, I, I think the other thing that like really jumps out to me is that when Randy Newman is often writing songs, the characters are, um, well, very frequently sort of um, colorful people and uh, the sorts of colorful folks that you are likely to find in a place like New Orleans. Uh, I'm often very drawn to the particular ways in which he describes people or um, presents people in his songs and so um, just a huge huge admirer of Randy Newman and his work. Um, speaking of songs in Louisiana, um, I am going to have the privilege of playing for you uh, a song he wrote about uh, terrible tragic flooding in Louisiana in 1927. Um, the song is called Louisiana 1927. Um, describes um, really the devastation that happened in a particularly poor area of Louisiana uh, and includes kind of a fictitious visit from the president who uh, is somewhat unsympathetic to the plight of, of the poor people suffering from that. Um, the song came back around and was particularly sort of uh, poignant when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, um, but I think, um, yeah, I just think it's a really perfect, uh, perfect short tune that, that captures really everything you want to capture in a song. So here it is. Here is Louisiana, 1927. Evangeline. The 
river rolls on, day the river rolls on. River bus on through down a black of mine. Six feet of water on the streets of a vengeful line. Louisiana, Louisiana, they're trying to wash us away. They're trying to wash us away. Louisiana. President Cool has come down on a railroad line. With a little fat man and an old pad in his hand. And President said, Hey, little fat man, isn't it a shame? The river has done this poor cracker's land. They are trying to wash us away. They are trying to wash us away. Louisiana. Louisiana. They are trying to wash us away. They are trying to wash us away. They are trying to wash us away. They are trying to wash us away.